I got in touch with Graham Parsons' music through uh, mainly through my interest in the birds when I was a teenager. Uh, um, I was a bird's nut uh, and uh, had a 12 string Rickenbacker. <laughs> so uh, I was really, 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 uh, no, I wouldn't say obsessed, but I really loved their music and uh, the harmonies and, you know, these beautiful songs. And, um, and finally, a friend of mine made me tape with, uh, some tracks from Sweet Out of the Rodeo, an album which I didn't know at the time. And, uh, and also two tracks uh, by the Flying Burrito Brothers. One of them was Hot Burrito Number no. 1, which I think is one of the most beautiful vocal performances by, by a white male ever. It's, it's not a, <laughs> singing out of tune a little bit, the band is playing kind of sloppily, but, you know, it doesn't matter. There was so much passion in that music, and um, the song is so great, and I just loved it, and I wanted to know more about it, and that's what got me in touch with Graham and uh, his music in the first place. The idea of making a film on Graham came a few years later. Um, I was a musician at the time, but I wanted to do something else and um, started working in film production a bit. And I had this idea, being, being a Graham Parsons fan and a fan of that era in particular, um, to make a, a documentary about him. Because I'd, once I'd heard about this story, uh, which is, well, pure southern gothic if you ask me, like right out of a... Tennessee Williams play, I thought this would be great subject matter for a documentary. But of course at the time I, w I was a kid and nobody would give me any, any funding to make a film like that. So it took me well, almost 10 years until my plans finally started to materialize. And then it took us another almost seven years in the making. Um, it was really, really complicated at first because uh, well, when we started to pitch it to TV stations or film commissions or potential funding partners, especially here in Europe, everybody said, well, Graham who? Graham Parsons? Who's that? He wasn't really, uh, well, a big name in the music mainstream, and especially people who are, uh, well, in charge of budgets, at least in Europe, um, are not big music fans, or at least not big rock and roll fans. So we had a hard time getting that off the ground. What finally helped was uh, that my, my friend Sid Griffin, who I actually met when I started to do research on this project without any funding, um, that he had some contact to the, to the BBC. And, um, well, Sid and I, we, we sat together for, for, for hours, again and again, discussing this, uh, the options, what we could do to get this off the ground. And finally, he, um, he made an appointment for us at the BBC. And we talked to Mark Cooper, the executive producer of the film, uh, who was a big Graham fan, too. And, um, he was the first one who said, okay, I mean, uh, if you want to do this, I would be willing to join the boat if you think you can get it off the ground. And, well, one thing came to, the, it came to another and um, in the end it was, um, well, the BBC's involvement that started the whole thing. You know, we got commission funding in Germany and two German TV stations joined, uh, but it was quite a way to go. We actually worked on the film uh, for almost six years. Principal photography was not that long, but um, just to get, well, the funding and um, the most difficult thing was to convince the contributors to find um, access to the Parsons family, um, to the Rolling Stones, uh, to the Eagles. Um, that was very, very difficult because, um, well, people were kind of reserved about our plans. Nobody knew, in the first place, nobody knew who we were or what we wanted to do with this. And, well, I think many people were still, uh, many people were still hurt or even some of them traumatized by what happened because, uh, well, Graham's life uh, and his self-destructive path were, um, I think, were kind of hard for the people around him uh, to take up with. So that was kind of an obstacle in the beginning. But, um, well, we just didn't take no for an answer, and um, I must say, um, I was naive, and that was probably what helped us make, make the film. If I had known all the obstacles we would have to go through, um, uh, we would have to overcome. I'm not sure if I had been prepared for the job, but, well, we learned um, why we were making it, I think, partly. It was very important to get access uh, to Ram's family, and... Um, I really don't know what I would have done without um, uh, Gretchen Carpenter and, and Diane Parsons um, finally opening up and saying, okay, w we will talk to you on camera, uh, we will share our memories uh, with you, but we also want to show 
well, another side of the story because um, I wasn't really aware of that when I when I started this because I was mainly a fan. But there was so many, there's been so much stuff written about Graham, and there are always people behind it. I mean, there are people who are still relatives who read stuff in the newspaper and the music magazines and. Um, who are probably heard every time, heard every time they, they read something about it, you know, like the, the bizarre funeral or, you know, the heroic way of, of burning the body in the desert. And um, I learned a lot about, not just about filmmaking, but, um, well, about humans, about people. And um, I realized just while I was making the film, um, what a big responsibility that was. I mean, we could have hurt people even more. and. I'm really grateful and happy that they are um, happy with the result now. Um, that's a good thing for me and makes me very happy. I must say, uh, generally speaking, um, the whole Parsons family was helpful. Becky Parsons, uh, God Sagan, who's uh, Bob Parsons' daughter from his first marriage, um, she helped me to add a little bit more of her father's perspective because I didn't want it to get out of balance, you know, just show him as the villain in the story or something like that. So. That was really helpful and um, also um, I was grateful that, that Polly Parsons um, talked to us, gave us an interview uh, and helped us a little bit with her perspective. Um, yeah, and, uh, I, th I think it would have been almost impossible to make the film the way we, we made it without having access to uh, the family archives and the support that we finally got from the whole family. Well, of course, it was it was very difficult to get um, access to the Rolling Stones. Um, they were were very helpful making the film in the end, but um, um, I, I mean, these people get requests. I guess I assume every day by all kinds of people who want an interview or have an interesting project. So the most difficult thing was to uh, get heard, actually, to um, uh, to get through to them. And um, I must say that we were extremely happy and extremely uh, grateful and lucky that we finally uh, got an interview with uh, with Keith Richards and um, the BBC helped with that they arranged that and um, I mean that was that was a really great thing and very important for the film also Chris Hillman who certainly has some reservations about about Graham uh, probably understandably after all his experiences he made during the several bands they played in together um, um, I mean his contribution was so important because um, uh, he helped me understand, um, well, the consequences that Graham's sometimes erratic behavior uh, would have on, on the band and the whole, you know, the whole situation with playing in the burritos and uh, also in the birds. So I'm, I'm really, really happy that he finally accepted to talk to us and I think he's just great in the film. I mean, this, uh, the way he, he sees things and his sense of humor. Uh, and even as understandable frustration sometimes, I, I think it's just great. After we had initially finished the version uh, for the BBC, I was a little bit unhappy with the loose, what I consider to be a loose end in, in the story, which was um, the role of Graham's uh, sister Avis. Uh, but at the time uh, of the, well, the actual production of the film, we didn't have more access to, um, to her or to her story because she died. I think uh, 11 years ago in a boating accident in 1994 I think and um, with one of her daughters so there wasn't really much I could find out about it. I talked to Diane, Graham's younger sister um, but you know she was very little at the time so I was very happy that um, a few months after we had actually finished the film uh, I got contact to um, Avis Parsons III who is um, Avis Avis's daughter, I mean, grand sister is Avis's daughter, and um, she was really helpful. She gave us access to um, a lot of her mother's personal uh, letters and, um, and memorabilia, and uh, gave me a great on-camera interview, which really helped me to add this perspective to the film. Because so many times people ask me after watching the film, uh, "Whatever happened to Avis?" And you know, if you hear that question 50 times, you maybe have to admit that there's something you didn't really answer in the film. So in this new version um, that we just finished, that you're watching, probably have just watched uh, on this DVD, um, it's, uh, it's really, I think, it, it has added much more depth to the story and much more detail. And uh, I think also a lot more of psychological background uh, to understand this, well, 
tragic down spiraling in Graham's life. Well, a project like that is, imp is impossible to make without uh, people you trust you can work with. And um, it was really, really important that Sid and I, um, well, try to stay in good spirits over all the years when nobody really cared about it, you know. Um, I'm not writing about it, it's just, you know, it was a matter of fact that we had a really hard time to get people interested in the film or in the project before we made it. But, I mean, once we made it, um, kind of all came together and I must say it was very important, especially in the editing process, that I could work with uh, Birgit Milt, the editor who um, probably worked more on the film than anybody, maybe except for me, maybe she worked even more than me, I'm not sure. but. Um, I mean, she did such a great job with all these amounts, loads of footage we had, almost a hundred hours of footage uh, that we filmed in interviews and, you know, creating that look. Um, people kind of underestimate the importance of an editor many times. It's not just somebody, you know, cutting stuff together. It's so much more and so much more important. So that was really important uh, for me to have that support uh, during the whole production. And I mean, of course, everybody's important in a production like that, you know, like that, you know, the, the director of photography, you know, the, the co-producers who bring the money, like my, my friend Alfred, who, who helped us get commission money here in Germany, or uh, Mark Cooper at the BBC, you know, but uh, I think at the end of the day, the film is getting made in the edit room, and, um, well, I did some of it, but uh, the editor built it, that's, I mean, that's really important. I try to be non-judgmental in the film about, uh, well, my conclusion about Graham, his life, his character, or some of the people uh, who were, uh, well, crucial in his life. Um, but there's one thing that was really important for me. I hope, I really tried not to romanticize or idealize um, addiction and depression. I think that's that's a crock. That happens so much in, in, in popular culture. And, I mean, it's interesting to read, but, you know, at the end of the day, uh, if the guy was still alive, he probably would still be making records, and we don't know how good the records would have been. And I don't buy that stuff anymore, you know, that to die young, leave a beautiful body, and, you know, this whole obsession with addiction and rock and roll. I mean, it's, it's sad for the people. Uh, who suffer from addiction or suffer from tradition of uh, depression in their families, but I don't see anything romantic about it, and um, I hope I didn't I didn't do that in the film. What in fact was very romantic for me was the actual um, time of uh, principal photography when we were shooting, because our budget was so low. All we had was you know a little van, and uh, my buddy Sid Griffin and our cameraman Boris Becker. Um, just, you know, driving around the south of the United States with equipment in it, you know, Sid or I assisting on sound, uh, kind of, well, learning on the job, but seeing this beautiful country and going to this, you know, these, these places that were so were instrumental uh, in our own histories as, uh, well, whatever you want to call us, you know, but uh, maybe artists, musicians, I don't know, but, you know, or just fans, you know, just, um, just having the opportunity to see all these places and to meet these great people, uh, that was the greatest thing for me at all. And I didn't care that we had to sleep on, on people's floors because we couldn't afford uh, hotel rooms. The whole time I was sure we were doing the right thing and I was so happy and so grateful that we could do it. And that's probably the thing I'm, I'm really still most grateful about. Um, you know, these people, they don't make them like that anymore. I mean, if you think about a band like the Flying Burrito Brothers in the year 2005, it's unthinkable, it's impossible. If you think of somebody like Michael Vossi, who was the executive hippie at A&M at, at Records at the time, somebody who would just work for the record company to kind of translate, translate the, the hipster lingo to the, to the, the guys in the suits, um, stuff like that doesn't exist anymore. You know, people just going with them on tour and holding a Super 8 camera, you know, these blurry pictures, and um, that was just amazing. And I mean, I wasn't even, probably wasn't even born back then, so uh, maybe I'm romanticizing something here a little bit, but, you know, I would want that people from my generation or younger people would kind of care more about music a little bit more and about the, well, the true spirit of it. I don't see that much of it anymore. and. Um, 
I'm really grateful for that experience. You know, people like Tom Wilkes, the, the art director for, uh, for A&M at the time, who made the beautiful burritos cover. Michael Vossi, the executive hippie, whose job was to be kind of the translator between the people who worked at, um, uh, at the record company and the bands. Um, they were so outrageous at the time and so, you know, daring what they did. You know, the whole concept was so different from what uh, happens in the music industry today that I must say um, I'm really, well, I can't say I'm proud, it's not my effort, but I'm grateful that, that I had a chance to, make these, uh, to meet these great people and just, you know, catch a glimpse of, uh, of those days, which are probably gone forever. Maybe not. <laughs>